We carefully selected this title, Taking Control of the Ebola Virus Outbreak. We purposely selected a title that really brings this to a working state where we begin to look at the problems, take them apart, and begin to come up with solutions. Let's look specifically at this epidemic itself. Why do I say that we need to look at it in perspective? Well, I list for you here the 10 top causes of death in the United States each year, and I want to point your attention particularly to the fact that influenza virus and associated pneumonia will be responsible for more than 50,000 deaths in 2014. This is overwhelming, and if you add to that just thinking about suicide, with close to 40,000 people, die, Americans dying each year, you realize we have plenty of epidemics that we need to manage, and we need to think about this epidemic like we do with others, take them apart into their component portions, and begin to think about how to treat and manage and eradicate. Um, since 1976, there have been numerous outbreaks. No one is really sure um, why the outbreaks start and why they ultimately go away. The thing um, this time that makes this very different, it's in a part of Africa where it's never been seen before. Um, and the number of those affected is, is, is really surpassed anything that we've seen in the past 40 years. So far, as you heard, 13,000 people have been infected. Nearly 5,000 have died. Um, of course, those are in West Africa. Uh, in one case here in the United States. And I think so many of us saw this as an international humanitarian issue until it hit our shores. And the minute uh, Mr. Duncan showed up in Texas and we heard that Ebola was on our shores, so many Americans uh, became interested and became fearful. I mean, you, we've heard a lot of hysteria about uh, uh, cleaning the bowling alleys and closing right, the right. schools in Texas because there was a child who sneaked. What, what should we be worried about in terms of the possible contamination? Sure. I, I would say the first thing that we all need to remember is that, that the science uh, behind understanding transmission of Ebola is sound. It's very important, I think, um, for everybody to know, and including our healthcare workers to know, that um, the course of the illness is, is fairly standard. You know, if somebody is infected, say, on, on October 1st, um, they're likely to be asymptomatic for a while. 10, 12 days, and during that period, they are not uh, contagious. They're not. They're not capable of transmitting that illness. So they're not dangerous to anybody. They're at not that point. dangerous at that point. That means riding the subways, eating in restaurants. Um, it's just there's just no risk there. The other thing I do want to mention about symptom uh, symptomatology that's very important as well to remember is that this is not the symptoms are not typically those you would find uh, in in people who have a cold or the flu. It's not. It's not sneezing. You know, it's not a lot of, um, you know, stuffy nose and, and the like. Um, and so, um, you know, when we're sitting in the subway or we're sitting in a restaurant and somebody is sneezing, uh, you know, you can just mentally click off in your head, okay, I'm not going to worry about Ebola in that patient. I am going to worry about flu, which, by the way, kills a lot more people. And if you haven't had a flu shot, I would strongly <laughs> encourage you to because that is life-saving. Ebola is very strong inside of us. It actually, the term was brittle, I think, was what was used before. It's actually very fragile outside of us. And again, in this case, I'll use the analogy more to, to HIV. Um, you're not going to get Ebola from a doorknob, a subway handle, a bowling ball, um, unless it's really contaminated with blood or body fluids. If somebody um, has fever early on in the disease and they use a pen and they sign a clipboard, is that pen going to transmit Ebola? Is that clipboard going to transmit Ebola? And the answer is no. You mentioned isolation, Dr. Ecclesburg, and at the risk of throwing you into a political debate, <laughs> although it is a week for politics, um, what about quarantines? Quarantine works when somebody is infectious and when somebody is sick. Um, quarantine is not going to be effective in a disease where if you're asymptomatic, you're not a threat. Uh, I, I see no value in formally quarantining people who are asymptomatic, and I see a tremendous amount of risk in terms of, number one, decreasing the number of folks uh, who will, will fight the illness overseas, but even in our country. Stigmatizing. Absolutely. And you know, there's, there's the law of unintended consequences, and this is one of those classic cases where it looks like the right solution, but it's you know simple, obvious, and wrong. And, and the unintended consequence, I believe, will be that a lot less people will be willing to treat patients in Africa and here as well. Now, the issue of self-quarantining is a different matter. The issue of self-monitoring, of staying in touch with the Department of Health, and having regular daily contact so that you can communicate about symptoms or have your questions answered, that's a very different scenario and I think a much more realistic one. What about the
the World Health Organization's assertion that um, the pharmaceutical industry has been slow with vaccines because you're mostly talking about countries that can't afford to pay, that in other words, the incentive is not there because you know, there's not the, the gain to be made. What do you make of that? Well, unfortunately, vaccines um, over the last couple of decades um, have not um, been uh, supported much by, um, by pharmaceutical companies. Um, it's, it, you know, you, you, you get a lot more for a, um, one dose of Viagra um, than, you know, a, a dose of a uh, childhood vaccine, a lot more, frankly, that is life-saving. Vaccine is, is, is going to be um, a major um, strategy for controlling this, uh, this outbreak. So there are two vaccines right now which really seem to be very promising. And they actually are going to be studied in, in Africa and probably in the United States military. There's also in Western Africa on the end of this year, beginning of, of next year. So the drug that um, probably most folks are familiar with is ZMAP because um, that was what Dr. Brantley received. Um, so those were pretty much monoclonal antibodies, so antibodies that were manufactured against the virus. Um, the, the, the technique or the technology that's used to make ZMAP involves um, use of a tobacco plant, and it's a very slow process, which is why that there are not hundreds of doses or thousands of doses. There were enough, I believe, to treat at most 12 people. Um, and those got used up very quickly. There is another experimental medicine um, that um, we heard a little bit about DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Um, so with RNA viruses, the way the viruses make babies is through a process called transcription. And so there's one drug which prevents that from happening. That again was um, in very short supply and that's used up. And um, the last drug um, that's been really used is something called Brin Cydofavir. Um, that's a medicine that for those of us that have taken care of patients with AIDS um, or maybe cancer patients who get another virus called CMV, it's a medicine that's used against CMV that seems to have activity against Ebola. No one knows why yet, because um, CMV and the other viruses that the Brin Cydofavir works against are DNA viruses. Ebola is an RNA virus, but it seems to work. Again, there are not large trials. These medicines have not been used on large amounts of, of patients, so we can't say that they're truly effective or not. All of it is really anecdotal at this point. Well, you have just enlightened us so much, and I hope so many of you feel like you have a lot more knowledge now about what we're really facing when it comes to Ebola. Dr. Jeremy Bowl, Dr. Brian Cole, and Dr. Joel Ecclesburg, we can talk all day. But unfortunately, we have to wrap it up.